Well, we'll make a formal start now. Uh, welcome to the second meeting of 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item of the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones that can interfere with the broadcasting system. Uh, committee members may use tablets uh, during the meeting. This is because it provides meeting papers in digital format, etc. Um, first of all, I have an apology from Michael Russell, uh, who has to be away on... Uh, other business in the constituency and uh, agenda item one today is a declaration of interest. Um, we welcome our newest member of the committee, Sarah Boyack, to declare any relevant interest just now, Sarah. Uh, thanks very much, Rob. I have nothing to declare. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the outgoing member of the committee, Cara Hilton, for her contribution to her work and uh, We'll have to arrange to get another photograph with the current membership, which um, means that we now have a whole array of them on the wall. But uh, welcome, Sarah, and uh, your previous experience in this area will be additional uh, strength to our deliberations. So thank you for that. Agenda item two, decision on taking business in private. Second item is to uh, consider whether it's uh, necessary to consider <laughs> the draft report in the Scottish Government's National Marine Plan to be taken in private at future meetings. Are we agreed to, to do so? We are agreed. Thank you. Um, agenda item three is Scotland's National Marine Plan, and this allows us to ask questions of the Scottish Government uh, via Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. Uh, who's here with us today and accompanied by Linda Rosborough, the Director of Marine Scotland, and Anna Donald, the Head of Marine Planning and Strategy in the Scottish Government. Welcome, Cabinet Secretary and your officials. Uh, I wonder if you have any short opening remarks. We'd be glad to have them just now. Good morning. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning to the committee and a special welcome to your new committee member, Siri Boyack. And I also thank you for the opportunity to give evidence on Scotland's first national marine plan. As you are aware, marine planning is a new process, and I welcome your input to the scrutiny process that's now underway. Not only is it a new process, of course, I, I genuinely believe that marine plan is groundbreaking and has the potential to be world-leading. We are effectively introducing a planning framework to our seas for the first time to help us manage the competing interests with many valuable sectors using our waters to support literally hundreds of thousands of Scottish livelihoods, our economy, and of course we want to protect our natural environment and ensure that these sectors are carrying out their activities in a sustainable manner. We rely on our seas for food, energy, and many other valuable uh, factors. So that's really what this is all about, is protecting our seas and doing what's best for our economy at the same time. The plan before Parliament represents the culmination of a, a long and involved process starting with Marine Scotland Act 2010 through a pre-consultation draft plan in 2011 and extensive consultation in the draft plan in 2013. This process has been marked by intensive stakeholder involvement throughout, which has very much helped to shape the plan as it now stands. I am pleased with the evidence from stakeholders at this stage, which is supportive of the point we have reached although obviously some are still looking for some detailed amendments and I've, I'm open-minded as far as that's concerned. The plan has a number of purposes, but the key aspects are to set out policies for sustainable development as required by the Act and to provide a framework for regional planning and decision-making. In doing so, the plan must recognise an appropriate balance between emerging and existing commercial activity, social and recreational use and the protection of the marine environment. It must also recognise the broad range of activity covered and the different states of maturity and levels of existing regulation which are already in place. It's important to, to make the point <coughs> that the plan does not seek to replace or contradict existing legislation and regulation. Rather, it provides a framework for that to operate in. As envisaged as at the time of the legislation was, when it was going through, the plan brings together a wide range of existing activity and crucially allows for the interactions and interconnections between the different sectors to be recognised and policies developed to manage that. It was informed by a number of supporting assessments, sustainability appraisal and business and regulator impact assessments, for instance. I also asked for an independent investigation into the plan to be carried out last summer, and the results of that have been taken fully on board and have very much strengthened the coverage of particular issues, particularly fishing. 
as I think Bertie Armstrong acknowledged was before the committee just last week. So primarily the plan has been shaped by consultation, by the input of a very wide range of stakeholders and members of the public. It is this consultation process which has identified the identification of key areas on which we now focus and the level of de detail that is required in relation to these particular policies. I also want to just reiterate the plan must be in conformity with the UK-wide marine policy statement and will inform future regional marine planning and decision making. The range of decisions to which it can apply is wide. All these decisions by a public authority which impact the marine environment. This ranges from the, the Crown Estate leasing to planning decisions by local authorities. So it's vital we have this planning function in place in order to better manage human impact on the marine environment and to do so in a way which is beyond the current silos. As I've said before, the marine environment is central to the delivery of many benefits and goods and services for our society. Therefore, it simply sets out a framework for the sustainable development of our seas and a framework which seeks to protect those goods and services. As a result of the feedback, Chapter C and 4 set out in detail how the plan will deliver sustainable development, in particular in terms of the application of the general policies which apply across all development and use. We're also using the GIS portal, which is the Geographical Information System, and the National Marine Plan Interactive, which you'll find on the website. That now contains 450 layers of relevant data to marine planning. So that's a key element of the evidence base and represents the future of marine planning where the information and evidence base is going to be web-based and fully accessible. Regional data can already be uploaded to that. It's not just national data, it's regional data. And Shetland and the Solway are amongst the regions which have already used that facility. So more data, more data is in the pipeline and will be added to that over time in line with local requirements around the country. I could mention lots of other different issues, but I hope that just sets in context how we've got to where we are today with the, the National Marine Plan, its aims and objectives, and the fact that it's effectively establishing a single framework for what is already existing and out there at the moment, be that European legislation, domestic, UK or international. So I hope that puts it in context for you. That's a great help, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thanks very much for that. Um, we have uh, in our stakeholder inquiries and discussions recognised that in the national document there's a kind of conflict between outlining high detail, highly detailed and prescriptive actions uh, on certain issues, but um, much vaguer, uh, less detailed actions than others. Indeed, um, as I said last week, you know, there's a danger of it becoming a little too specific on certain local activities in the National Marine Plan. And, uh, you know, I just wonder wh what you see, first of all, the purpose of the National Marine Plan to be. And is it set, setting out a high-level overarching framework for marine planning, or is it to provide detailed and sometimes local prescriptive actions? Well, I very much see the <coughs> National Marine Plan as our, our first major attempt at providing a single framework for the future planning for our seas. And of course, our marine industries, our, our seas are very, very important to Scotland for the reasons I outlined in open remarks. And as we know from experience, since especially this, is, this parliament has been established in 1999, there are traditional sectors using our waters and there are many emerging sectors which rely on our seas as well particularly clearly renewables and there's recreational marine tourism and, and so on. Therefore, <coughs> to provide a single framework to which our planners can refer, I think will be extremely valuable in the times ahead. So firstly, it should hopefully be a practical framework to be used by planners around the country. And clearly there's been a demand from this committee and from Parliament and more importantly from the people of Scotland to have regional input and regional decision making as we take forward the planning mm -hmm. for our seas. So for our regional planners and our regional plans which will be developed over time to have a single national framework to refer to and set everything in context I think is very valuable. Another important use of the plan will be to address where there's potential conflicts and clearly the idea of laying out policies for the future of our marine sectors and our seas should hopefully give some pointers and policy context, to, again, to local planners as to how they can address some of these conflicts. 
because clearly in some parts of our waters we could have aquaculture, we could have renewables, we could have fisheries, we could have recreational activities, we could have marine tourism. And for local planners to work out where aquaculture sites may be best located or to work with national policy and renewables or the Crown Estate, which is going to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, having a context to refer to as to what the country's national policies are and the guidance and the decisions there to work with, I think, will be extremely valuable for the future. And <clears throat> there are a number of references in the Marine Plan to give helpful pointers as to how to address issues of conflict, because clearly there are conflicts potentially between different sectors and planners locally and indeed national policy makers will be able to refer to that in terms of having some ideas of how to address those conflicts. Uh, Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I don't think any of us would have any problem with, with, yeah. with exactly what you've described, which is a, a, a general document of guidance for, for the whole marine planning process. Um, but I, I think a number of us over the, the weeks of uh, the past few weeks have um, increased concerns that in some ways the plan is sort of delving into micromanagement or regional management, if you like, in, in some areas. And um, the example I would bring to you is uh, there's, a, there's a section on um, economic development and tourism which um, specifies certain activities around different parts of the country. And in my own part of the country, Galloway, it highlights as being very, um, a, a very strong area for, for recreational sea angling. True. Um, but somebody looking at that, the, the, that part of the, the, the plan as drafted would look at that and say, Galloway's no use for any other activity other than recreational sea angling, which is not true. Um, and I just, that's a very simplistic example of where I think some of us feel that the marine plan has slightly lost its, its overall guidance role uh, and become involved in regional management. Uh, and I just wonder, I know we're going to come <coughs> to, to that sort of discussion later on, but I just, I wonder if, if you, you've picked that up from the evidence that we've taken so far. Well, clearly, <coughs> just to remind the committee, the process is that we have the plan laid before Parliament for scrutiny. And until the time comes when ministers decide to adopt the plan, we can amend it and change it in light of the committee's comments. And you're clearly playing a very valuable role and you'll, you'll feed back via your report to the to Parliament your thoughts of what could be possibly be changed. I'm open-minded as I come to the committee on that. However, <clears throat> I would just, to answer your point directly, say that as part of the consultation project process, we were very much guided from feedback from different parts of the country and that was fed into the National Marine Plan. So I'm confident that in terms of the example you give from your own uh, constituency and that part of Scotland, that will have been a reflection on what we've had fed back to us from local interests in, in South West Scotland, i.e. recreational angling or other activities are very important to the local economy there and should be reflected in the, the policy statement and used potentially as an example of the kind of policies we want to protect and, and pursue. So that will have influenced why that's in the, the document is because of the feedback from your own constituency and, and local authorities. Uh, and in terms of what's covered and what's not covered within the plan, well, clearly we do have national policies, and this is a national marine plan which will inform regional marine plans, and we have national policies. We have national policies to have a, an oil and gas industry, we have national policies to support aquaculture and the development of aquaculture and so on. So these are existing policies, national policies, and it's very important they are in the National Marine Plan because they're national policies. And as a country, as a government, as a parliament, we support that and we've taken decisions in the past to support that. Therefore, any regional planner or regional plan should reflect national policy. <laughs> I, absolutely, uh, and I really have no argument with that whatsoever, Cabinet Secretary. Where I, where I do have a concern is where a document and a plan covering national policies, quite rightly, therefore highlights regional priorities. Uh, and I, I just can't work out how those two coexist. <coughs> I know we're going to come to a sort of coexistence between regional plans later on, so yeah. maybe that will develop as well. I think Linda Ross, but Director of Maine Scotland, just wants to add something in. Well, if I, if I could just come in. Um, we're starting from quite a low base in some areas in that because things have been very silo-based in the past, often people aren't aware of other marine activities. So um, 
all the recreational activities are hugely important, they're economically important, they're important to people, but that's not always appreciated. So part of the purpose of the plan is to <coughs> highlight these sectors and their importance. The particular um, part of the plan where we um, tried to identify what was particularly important in different parts of Scotland arose from consultation with recreational and um, marine tourism interests as to what they saw as the nationally important activities in different parts of Scotland. And that was then consulted upon. Now, obviously, these activities will take place all throughout Scotland. Um, and you, you could just do, list that. Um, but those operators were advising us that these were what they saw as, as nationally significant. Um, I think that the challenge is always in a plan, which is the first, and you're, you're, you're putting these things down for the first time, um, to try and get what's of national significance um, and get that in at the right level um, without turning it into something that's so bland that you, you really don't get into the detail at all. Now, the plan also refers to quite an important study <coughs> which is underway at the moment on, um, on, on these areas and we will be um, putting a lot of data in consequence of that on National Marine Plan <coughs> Interactive. So this is not the end of the story, but and we can certainly look at, at this sort of thing again as well. But just to try and give you an understanding of how this came to be, it's not, it's not to deny that these activities happen elsewhere, it's the national significance of the activity um, was what we were trying to address. Okay. I think that's an important point, because I think <clears throat> what we found in terms of the process was as we consulted and the stakeholders, so it may be a national organisation representing angling or whatever, would highlight, as Linda has just said, a nationally important aspect of that in one part of the country. In other words, if you're having a national marine plan, you can't possibly miss out the importance of recreational angling or whatever in southwest Scotland, because that's particularly important there and nationally it's important. Therefore, having it in the national marine plan helps guide the regional plans because you can't possibly have a regional plan without recognising that this is nationally important. So it's, that's really how it's guided and what to include and what not to include. I mean, to be fair, um, it mentions not just the Priest and Galloway, but Argyle, North East Coast and the Orkney Islands, um, you know, in that particular section on recreational sea angling. So it's pinpointing some people who've highlighted that, but it doesn't exclude it from being dealt with as a matter of interest in other areas, you're saying. Okay. Well, um, we'll come into some more of the detail in a wee while. Um, I guess McDonald's uh, has a question now. Okay, thanks, uh, Convener. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, clearly important that the effectiveness and performance of marine planning uh, is measured regularly and effectively. Um, can you uh, perhaps tell uh, the committee how will the performance and success of marine planning be determined? and reported on, uh, as it's not yet entirely clear uh, how that will be done, um, given uh, evidence that we've taken from representatives from SAMS. Okay, <clears throat> well clearly, as the Act stipulates, we have to uh, promote sustainable development, have an ecosystem approach, etc., in terms of how we manage our seas, and the National Marine Plan will be reviewed after five years. And this is unfortunately not helpful, but under UK legislation, the reserved issues and the, I, I expect from 12 to 200 miles aspects of yep. the National Marine Plan have to be reviewed after three years. So our intention is clearly to review, as we have to under statute, after three years those reserved issues and from 12 to 200 miles under the UK legislation and then use that information from that review to feed into the wider review, the five-year review that will happen thereafter because that's the simplest way of doing it. So what you're asking will be primarily addressed through the review of the marine plan but of course elsewhere in government we have to account for our, our European legislation and all the other legislation that's referred to within here. So the document, as I said before, is a single framework that brings together existing commitments and existing obligations. So there are no doubt other areas of government where, as a matter of course, we'll have to be reviewing the, the legislation that's referred to within here. Okay. So taking all that on board, 
um, what flexibility is there to, to adapt the plan at uh, later stages? Total flexibility, as long as uh, ministers make a statement to Parliament if they're amending, they have to explain why they're amending uh, as part of the before we adopt it, if we're adopting an amended version of the main plan. And then thereafter, uh, there is clearly the reviews that will take place. But at the moment, we have total flexibility of what to do with this plan. Uh, and that's why we will await your feedback. OK. Thank you. A supplementary, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Just to clarify something, you said that you'd be required to review the 12 to 200 mile aspect of it to, uh, um, after three years. I think you said something about, and that would then feed into the process at the five year stage. Does that mean that if you identify issues at the three year point of review, you would have to wait till five years plus to do anything about it, or would you have the flexibility to act on those immediately? Well, I think we've got the flexibility to act on this. This is a, it's a national marine plan, but we've got the flexibility to act at any point in time. Uh, ministers have that ability. Uh, clearly, you know, we'll take a common sense approach. Uh, it's, it's a national marine plan, it's a framework. Actual decisions that are taken by authorities have to refer to it and take it into account as a material um, interest. But we'll have flexibility clearly on a, a day to day basis to work with local authorities and, and regional partnerships once they're up and running. Okay, thank you. That feeds us well into the discussion about the local and the national marine plans, which Sarah Boyack is going to lead on just now. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I'm quite interested in teasing out, once we've got the national marine plan in place, how the regional marine plans um, develop, how they fit into that process. And there are a lot of amendments that are made in the modifications report, um, almost every chapter, I think, there's a, a new regional policy section that's been added. And it's really to tease out the relationship between the regional marine plans and the national marine plans, and just picking up that timing point, um, how to get the right balance between the national and the regional level. And it's one of the things that comes up in evidence, um, divergent views on whether it should be the national plan translated into detail or whether there is scope for different views at the regional level. Just wondering what, how you see that panning out. Well, it's a very good question and I will answer the question, but clearly because this is the first time we're doing this, we will have to you know, adapt as time goes on. We reckon it's going to take quite a few years to have all the regional plans up and running in Scotland. As you know, there are some forerunners in that Shetland and the Clyde, for instance, are hopefully within the near future going to be moving forward to getting up and running. They're not formal yet, but they're, they're, they're going to be the first two most likely up and running in Scotland. And they're keen and you know want to go on with things and they want to be the pilots. So it'll be a bit of a learning process. But in terms of how you know we expect it to pan out is we have the National Marine Plan, which anyone consenting any particular licence for any particular activity or drawing up a local plan, a regional plan, will have to refer to. And the regional plans can't conflict with the national plan. So whilst the national plan is laying out national policies in the single framework, it's not determining how many aquaculture sites there are in Shetland or how many aquaculture sites there are in any part of Scotland. Uh, the regional plans will have the opportunity to put national policy into regional context. But it can't conflict with the national plan because quite clearly as a country we support aquaculture. Uh, therefore, uh, those who are seeking consents will clearly be able to challenge their local uh, regional plans or local authorities who are refusing consents if it was to conflict with the national plan. Can I ask a supplementary? Because sure. it's quite important to tease this out because we'll have the national framework and then we'll have the regional framework. Um, there will be consultation at both levels. So you've done the consultation in the national plan. We've got, we will have that at the regional level. I'm just thinking about how you actually arbitrate um, whether the national government will want to change its mind, having seen representations at the regional level where there's been 
uh, consultation and in the terrestrial planning system there's a clear set of processes. Have you set out exactly how those processes will work in terms of <coughs> people wanting to appeal, local authorities being unhappy and wanting to challenge your decision? Have you set out the framework um, or can you set out the framework so that people can understand that because we've had representations from COSLA on the one side wanting lots of local variation and then on the other side um, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation for example worried that the regional plans will vary wildly from area to area. How does that, how does that conflict get arbitrated? Is that you as a minister or will there be a, a set of processes that people will understand? Well, we will publish guidance on that, and once the pilots are up and running, that's something we're working with them on, because quite clearly we have to iron out what will happen in certain circumstances, except that, and that's what we're going to do with the pilots once we get them up and running, so we can understand when they're putting the regional plans together, and Marine Scotland will have a, a lead role, obviously, in guiding and working with local authorities. Um, I think Anna wants to come in here just to explain what conversations are taking place. Just to clarify um, a little on that, as the Cabinet Secretary was pointing out, um, ministers obviously have a role in adopting the Regional Marine Plan and could make a decision not to adopt um, for whatever reason, whether it's a conflict with the National Marine Plan or there may be other issues that come to the minister's attention. There's also a, a legal process set out in the Marine Scotland Act that relates to both national and regional marine plans under section 17 and 18 of the Act whereby other parties could make legal representations about the content of a plan. So there's a direct route for other parties to do that legally as well. Can I just ask a, a small supplementary about that? Um, in terms of how pilots will run, are you going to do a selection of geographical pilots? Um, and are you going to intimate that to certain local authorities so that they know that they are the ones that are ahead of the game in this? Okay. So... <clears throat> There are 11 regions identified in Scotland who, that will be designated as marine regions. And the, the two that are furthest ahead of the game are Clyde and Shetland. And we expect, for instance, in the island authorities, for the local authorities to be the lead partners in the marine partnerships that will put together the regional marine plans. Um, and no doubt it's likely to be local authorities in other areas, but these are areas where uh, we know that's uh, likely to be the case in island authorities. And in Shetland, for instance, the, the, the partnerships effectively we expect to be the college and the local authority. So they will work together, uh, no, consulting with everyone else, to, to draw up the <coughs> regional plan in Shetland. Um, so... The local authorities are aware of that, and I said before, because there's 11 regions, we anticipate it will take some time for the other regions to get up and running. Okay, thank you. Okay, fine. Um, Jim Hume, yes, I think yep. it follows on in this point. So yeah, I th checking. I think, yeah, I think we'll just, uh, just you, you mentioned there about, uh, sorry, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned about the uh, local authorities being the lead uh, Partners and of course Shetland and Clyde are well ahead of the game. But there was concern that we've had from uh, at least a, a two of our um, witnesses, if you like, last week. Lucy Greenhill from uh, the Scottish Association of uh, Marine Science and Bertie Armstrong. Bertie Armstrong himself said, uh, in a quote, "We remain frightened about the potential of effect of lack of expertise at, at, at regional levels." And uh, Lucy Greenhill. Uh, who I mentioned said that uh, people at regional level will struggle to replicate or improve on the quality of planning that is undertaken at national level. Uh, as she too was concerned that there would be a, a lack of expertise in, in local uh, authorities. So I was just wondering wh where, where yourself thinks that we're actually going to get the expertise to go on to these regional uh, local authority uh, boards who are going to be driving yeah. the plans forward. Yeah. So there will have to be a lot of effort in the years ahead to build up that expertise. I'm not denying that, just as we've had to do the same at national level with Marine Scotland over the last few years. However, I don't think we should underestimate existing expertise with our coastal authorities, because quite clearly our authorities are already dealing with many of the issues and build up some expertise with some of the individual sectors 
that are very relevant and are most likely to be coming forward for consents and most likely to be featuring in the regional plans. So local authorities already have expertise dealing with aquaculture and in some cases the offshore sector and clearly there are inshore fisheries groups already up and running in Scotland. Uh, so there's, there's a variety of sectors where there's uh, already activity, therefore there's expertise at local level and local authorities already involved in consent processes or local policy making. We already have coastal forums in Scotland. So, on the one hand, I'm not saying that we don't have to build up more expertise. On the other hand, we're starting from a base where there is reasonable expertise in many local authorities with many of the issues that are most likely to be featuring in regional plans. So, we'll have to uh, ensure that we're sharing that best practice and expertise across Scotland and building it up across all parts of Scotland in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. So, will, um, will that be done centrally from the Scottish Government? Will they aid uh, local authorities to set up these? Um, yes, we will be, and Marine Scotland will be doing it. They're doing it already, and we'll okay. be doing a lot of that in the coming years. Mm -hmm. uh, as more and more authorities come forward to be first in the queue, uh, you know, clearly they're the ones that we'll be dealing with the most. Okay, that's useful. Thanks. Angus MacDonald. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. If I could briefly uh, deal with the National Marine Plan uh, Interactive. Um, as we know, it's designed to assist with the, the development of national and regional uh, marine planning. Um, however, uh, there have been concerns raised in evidence given by uh, the associated British ports uh, that commercial anchorages don't uh, appear to be mapped in the NMPI. Uh, and there also seems to be no acknowledgement of navigational approaches to ports, uh, which is also of concern to the ABP, as is the lack of any um, a mapping of, of uh, sludge or spoil areas from, from dredging. Uh, so they're obviously keen to ensure that navigation approaches are included uh, in the NMPI and are protected. Um, can you give the committee an assurance that, uh, that these will now be included in the NMPI, uh, and not just uh, anchorages, but also the other? Um, yes. Bits and pieces. Well, yes, I can give you an assurance. I, I, I'll, I'll take that on board, and you know, I'm, I'm open-minded about including it. I'll obviously, I don't see any objection to doing that. I'll have a look at it. Uh, we're very much reflected where we've got to today by the consultation process so far. So I, I'm, I'm not convinced that it became a big feature during the consultation process, but that doesn't uh, detract from the fact I'm very happy to take on board their representations. <laughs> And if we can conclude that, we will do that. I don't see any, any obstacle to doing that. Yeah, I think I, that yeah. I mean, there are a number of things that are on our list to be added, and those are amongst them. Um, so, yes, we are, we are working on, on that. Sometimes there can be technical issues about who owns the data and rights. You know, there, there can be issues like that. Sometimes there's issues about what sort of baseline it's on um, and compatibility. So sometimes there's some issues to work through. But um, we are committed to continuing to add and those particular shipping related issues are, are on our list. Do you have other examples of that? No. Other, examples of other things, things that are on list. my list? Yeah, yeah um, we will, I hope in the next month, be putting on new um, fishing sensitivity data maps. Um, this will be about showing where, which areas of the sea are, are most sensitive if they were to be lost from a fishing perspective. Um, and that I think is 26 layers covering um, 13 or 14 commercial species, so that's that's quite a substantial additional amount of data in relation to fishing, which should be really beneficial in terms of um, ensuring that that important area is, is protected. I mentioned tourism already, that's another area where we have um, projects in place designed to deliver future, you know, greater data for NMPI. So it's very much an iterative process, and we are talking to the two um, front-runner marine spatial planning pilots about what their needs are. And I think, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, we already do have some data that's been put up on NPI by, by regions, and we very much welcome that and want to work with um, the regions to increase that. I just wanted to add, we've got a Scotland Seas Data and Assessment Group, which is a sort of partnership between ourselves, Marine Scotland, um, SEPA, SNH, the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology Scotland, um, and other partners who were involved in developing Scotland's Marine Atlas, 
to oversee the kind of ongoing development of NMPI. So where we have requests or we become aware of data that spatial data that's available from other industries or different sources, um, th the process we go through is to take it to that group to look at quality assurance, the, some of the issues around licensing, etc., that Linda uh, referred to, um, and to take a decision about how quickly and, and in what form we can get that onto NMPI. And as um, the Cabinet Secretary and Linda have both made clear, we're very keen to keep developing that system as, as much as we can, so we're very open to other um, options in terms of uh, uh, further data that we can host on that. That's very helpful. Uh, I right. um, well, I was just to ask, obviously it's an ongoing process, but do you have a time scale for when all the stuff on your list will be loaded onto the NMPA? Well, clearly, sorry. Well, I was just going to say clearly, ministers can decide when to adopt the plan. So we await your feedback as a committee, and <laughs> clearly some representations from other stakeholders in Scotland. Um, so we will gather all that in, and I can't give an exact time scale just now when we'll adopt the plan. But you know, we will do that as soon as as practical. I mean, to be honest, I should also say that it's, it's probably a never-ending task, and that there's always new data coming along. Good. That's interactive to the end. Back to the tool on, on the web. Just to reiterate, there's over 450 layers of data that can be added. And if you've not had a chance to go onto the website, you can choose what to add. And there's various buttons you can click. So you can add on aquaculture sites, you can add on this or that. So it's a way that should be very helpful to local authorities and the regional uh, partnerships to just build up their, their local uh, regional maps. Fine. Thanks for that. Um, well, looking you know, how the National Marine Plan links with other legislation and duties, Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Convener. And I, I think the Cabinet Secretary referred to this briefly in his opening remarks. But um, it was raised by uh, – uh, there was a concern raised by a number of stakeholders that um, the plan does not link to – or does not link enough, perhaps, to existing le regulation and, and legislation. Um, the Marine Conservation Society particularly um, highlighted the fact that the plan does not link to the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy, which is obviously quite important in terms of this, this particular plan. Um, Bertie Armstrong's submission makes the point that uh, there are already a range of regulations that govern fishing, um, and he failed to see where that fits in with some of the issues in the National Marine Plan. So I'm really, my question is um, to ask why there is so little reference to existing regulations and, and guidance, and um, whether, whether you feel that links to such regulation and guidance would, would, would actually help stakeholders better understand what is meant and how to, how to work within the National Marine Plan. Well, I'm happy to consider the points. I mean, clearly, I, I want to avoid adding another 50 pages to the National Marine Plan in terms of listing all the various regulations, because this is a, a framework. It's about policy. It's about objectives. And it's, you know, about <coughs> giving guidance to how we can have various sectors working together in the same areas of seas. So I'll certainly give some thought to that. The plan, of course, is, is framed in the context of legislation, i.e. European legislation and the various directives that we have adopted, the Marine Strategy Directive, etc., the various indicators for good environmental status. That's the context of the plans. So you'll see in the first couple of chapters, for instance, the context of sustainable development, the context of ecosystem approaches. M much of that flows from our European obligations. So the plan is framed in the context of our obligations, and we try to explain how we're delivering that, and each chapter is laid out in each sector. Um, so I, all I can give an assurance for at the moment is I'll, I'll take away the point about not enough reference to relevant regulations. But the, the, the caveat is clearly I don't want to start listing hundreds of regulations in the National Marine Plan. Just a couple of um, things that might be of assistance. Um, one of the changes we've made between the consultation draft and the draft that's before Parliament was to add a key references section to each of the sector chapters, um, which probably focuses more on relevant policy documents than on 
basic legislation, um, but we could consider potentially listing the key aspects of legislation in those sections, which would be quite a light touch way of making sure the context was stated, but as the Cabinet Secretary was um, referring to, doesn't run into sort of pages of additional text, which I think wouldn't be helpful. Um, the other thing to note is that we've developed our website, so we've got a sort of National Marine Plan online section, which we launched at the same time as this came to Parliament, which has a section again for each chapter, which provides a lot of that context. Um, so I think there are existing mechanisms we can look at to see if there's other bits of context that we could include there. That's very, that's very helpful. Um, I, I've no doubt we'll mention something about this in our report when it comes, but that's a very helpful explanation. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any supplementary I don't this? think so at the moment, no, but uh, we want to talk about sea fishing uh, as a follow-on. Yes, and obviously one of the, one of the, 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 one of the principal, if not the principal, user of our marine environment uh, is, is the sea fishery sector hugely important to our national economy uh, as well as to the marine environment and um, th there are a number of issues came out of the well the original submission by the Scottish Fishermen's Federation which we distilled down a bit last week in, in the round table session um, and indeed um, Mr Armstrong has provided some further clarity of his existing concerns though he was happy to to say that a number of his concerns in the original consultation had now been addressed which was was good news um, we were all delighted with that, I think it would be fair to say, uh, as indeed was he. Um, but one of, the, one, of the, um, one of the remaining concerns of the sector um, is that um, he feels, or the SFF feels, that the presumption in favour of development and of existing use that is made early in, in the plan is, is watered down um, and eroded somewhat later on in the plan particularly under Sea Fisheries Chapter 3 marine planning policies under Fisheries 1 by the inclusion of, of two words that simply says wherever possible. And he feels that that very much dilutes the firm commitment given to, if you like, a right to fish, um, I suppose one could put it that way. And I just wondered whether the Cabinet Secretary had any thoughts on that or whether he would think about it um, uh, as, he, as he moves forward with this plan. Okay. I will reflect upon it, but see, clearly... To me, that's a very balanced reference, and it shows a very clear presumption in favour of existing opportunities and activities being safeguarded. I mean, one general comment I'd like to make to the committee is clearly you've taken very helpful evidence from various stakeholders. And if I was to address all the concerns of one particular stakeholder, I'd immediately just cause other concerns to be raised by other stakeholders. <laughs> so the, the, the Marine Plan is trying to take a balanced approach and a sensible approach in line with national policy, which I believe has got a lot of cross-party support in many of those issues. But I'm never going to be able to satisfy all stakeholders on every single issue because quite clearly I've seen some commentary in the last 24 hours from one stakeholder perhaps saying that we shouldn't be supporting fossil fuels. So they're not going to be happy with the fact that an oil and gas section in the National Marine Plan necessarily. But clearly, as a, as a parliament, as a government, as a country, we have a viable oil and gas industry. It's going to play an important role in the transition from fossil fuels to renewables. But I'm not going to satisfy those that don't believe in fossil fuels. And likewise, the fishing industry may have some remaining concerns that I can't quite go all the way to addressing because quite clearly we have to be balanced in, in how we approach this. So my, my comment would be, at the moment, I'm satisfied the, the reference in the report is, is balanced. You know, I will reflect on everything I hear from the committee today and, and in your reports, but that's my initial response. Um, uh, if I may continue a little, um, convenient. yes, I, I absolutely accept the need to find a balance, but I think you would also agree that it's the committee's duty to raise concerns that have been raised with it, particularly by a principal stakeholder in, in in the marine environment, uh, which, which is all I'm doing. I'm not yeah, sure. siding one, one way or the other with this, but I think it's important to put some of these concerns. Um, two, other if, two other concerns, if I may, that were raised with us by the SFF. One was the criticism, if you like, or concern that the marine plan would simply add another layer of regulation on what is already, a, I think you would agree, a fairly heavily regulated industry. And the second one was to do with safety, and this, this particularly came up in terms of um, laying and renewing uh, undersea cables um, when I think the SFF felt that not enough 
attention was being um, given to the safety aspect of that. Um, and I just wondered what, what, whether you could comment on those two concerns. Well, we carried out the independent assessment of the plan, as I mentioned in opening remarks, uh, last year, and subsequent to that, there were some extra safeguards referred to under the fishing section of the reports. So I think we've gone some way to address many of the concerns of the fishing industry. In terms of the cabling issue, in a couple of quick comments. Firstly, <coughs> I think we have taken a, 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 an approach towards safety, but also a risk-based approach. And whilst the cabling companies and perhaps some of the power companies clearly would rather not bury, I think they've made that quite clear, uh, we have said these issues have to be treated on a case-by-case -case basis. And of course, the recent, the recent uh, events with relation to the Jura cable, there were um, a number of weeks and months taken to take on board the representations of the fishing industry, because quite clearly we had a, a situation where the whole cable was to be replaced by the power company. It wasn't simply a repair as such. If it was just simply a repair to part the cable, then they would not have to necessarily go through the long protracted process for consents. But in that case, it was replacing the whole cable. And of course, we had representations from the Marine Coast Guard Agency, I think it was, and, and the industry itself, wanting more safety precautions to be taken in terms of burying parts of the cable. So I think we're trying to take a safe, a, 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 promote a safety culture at sea in terms of cabling. And we're trying to treat it as a case-by-case -case basis and a risk-based approach as well. So I think we've got a good balance there. And if, if I could, thank you for that, but if I could just ask you to address the, the concern they raised about even, even more regulation on, on an already heavily regulated sector. Sure. Well, I, d I don't believe it does add lots of more regulation. I think it just brings everything together in a single framework. There are policies, and if you don't like some of the policies, you ain't going to be happy. You know, you're perhaps wanting to you know, uh, not see those policies implemented fully at regional level and regional plans are put together or whatever. Uh, so there might be issues with policies in some parts of the, 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 the plan that, that in terms of what's been promoted to the plan and in turn those policies will be reflected in the regional plan. So I can understand that people might not be 100% happy to don't like the policies. Uh, but I don't think it adds lots more regulation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dave Thompson and then uh, Claudia <coughs> Beamish. Uh, uh, morning, Government Secretary and, and colleagues there. Um, welcome to the committee today. I, I would just like to <coughs> maybe reinforce uh, what uh, Alec Ferguson has said in relation to the, the sea fisheries. Uh, my own constituency in the Highlands and Islands generally rely to a great extent on fishing small remote communities and as the Cabinet Secretary is very well aware, you know, there have been serious problems and uh, a serious reduction in effort over the last few decades. And the industry needs uh, needs all the help it can get, basically. So, you know, you, you mentioned, Cabinet Secretary, that you thought the, the inclusion of the words wherever possible was, was balanced. I'm not sure I, I agree with you there. I, I, I think that uh, um, the SFF as well raised the point about a presumption in favour of existing activity, and given that fishing has been there for, well, forever, um, uh, more or less, and your, the current environment is there, despite the fact that fishing is there, or maybe because of the fact that fishing is there, I think it's important to emphasise uh, just how important fishing is, and I think I think the, the plan could be beefed up a bit in relation to that. So it's just to... Um, reinforce what Alec Ferguson said and, and ask if you have any further comment on that. My only comment would be, while I'm willing to listen to the report from the committee, and if that's reflecting your report, clearly I will take it on board and consider it, but I do think it does strike a good balance. I, I think, you know, we have the whole purpose of the Marine Plan uh, is to recognise the various goods and services supplied by our waters. So fishing is extremely important, and I, I battle hard for our fishing communities in Scotland on a regular basis, but I have to recognise that there are other uses uh, and benefits delivered by our, our waters. And therefore, you know, 
giving cast iron, written and blood guarantees to any particular sector, you know, I think is just stepping over the mark. I think you have to you know, say, look, we're doing our best to safeguard existing activities and wherever possible that will be done. But we're not going to write in blood and give cast iron guarantees that nothing will ever change because quite clearly we've got to do what's right for the national interest and, and that this plan is about balancing various competing interests in our waters. So I just think it strikes a good balance at the moment. So I don't want to give any indication that I'm you know, preparing to change that. But I, I will, of course, listen to the committee's report. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Convener, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, could I tease out the issue of um, the existing activity a little bit further with you? Um, in relation to sustainable development underpinning the, um, or being very much part of the framework for um, the marine environment and activity going forward, um, I wonder if it might be worth the consideration of, instead of a presumption in favour of existing activity, possibly consideration of adding the word sustainable activity. Because if one um, looks at the, the changing picture in terms of scientific evidence as it develops for our, uh, the protection of the marine environment um, and, and the, the adaptive management that is, is going to be happening moving forward, um, I, 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 like yourself, am extremely supportive of the fishing industry and of, of development within um, the marine environment. But I just wonder if that word sustainable should be there. And I would have concerns about the dangers of removing um, the phrase um, wherever possible, because I do think we do have to acknowledge that um, there may be times when, not, not what Bertie Armstrong in his evidence was arguing, which is that... Um, about the impossible, but just that some things may not be possible in terms of sustainable development, and that's a changing picture. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'll reflect on your suggestion. Clearly, I would just reiterate that the overall plan is is uh, written in the context of promoting sustainable development, and that's already there and very prominent in the plan and guides the plan. Um, so I'll reflect on, on your suggestion. But, you know, we, again, we just have to, to, to balance various interests. We've got the oil and gas industry, we've got the fishing industry, and we, you know, have to balance that with our other interests. So I'll reflect I do, on that. I, I, I do understand that, Cabinet Secretary, and respect that, but I'm simply arguing that existing activities should be sustainable and that is a, it is a changing picture in terms of the marine environment. That's the point I'm Take making. that on that, down board. We'll look forward to that convoluted sentence or paragraph when we come to making a report. <laughs> To, dis to, to debate that uh, behind closed doors, I suspect. Um, we were talking about impediments to fishing in the case of cables. I think Graham Day wants to ask some questions. On that. I, I do indeed, Camilla. Thank you. Um, following the evidence session we had last week, at which there were concerns raised about what the plan required, both in terms of, of new cables and replacing existing cables, I, I reread the marine plan. And it struck me rereading it, that there is room for common sense, case by case management of the situation, um, which is what Scottish Renewables have suggested is here. Yet SSEPD are deeply concerned that the plan would require them to underground cables, and they're talking about significant cost implications. Um, I'm wondering whether there is a need for um, further consultation in Chapter 4, as they've called for, or whether Cabinet Secretary, you could actually provide today to the committee, um, or by amending the plan, further clarity as to exactly what's been looked for? Well, again, I, I'll you know, listen to your, your views on this. I would simply say that our approach is to treat it as a case-by-case -case basis. And I understand why Power companies and cable companies would rather go for the cheapest option. But the cheapest option may not always be the safest option. And clearly, we've just been discussing the fishing industry, and <laughs> the fishing industry may take a different approach to where cables should be, whether it should be uh, above the seabed or, or below, below the seabed buried. So, you know, I think we're going down the right road here, having a risk-based approach because there will be circumstances where it does not have to be buried, but there are circumstances where it will have to be buried. So the representations from the power companies may well be to go for the, the, the most cost-effective, cheapest option. And clearly we will always take that into account because we recognise it's a very expensive business and if we want power to go to Jura or any other community, you know, we have to make sure that happens. That's in the interest of those communities. But we have to take on board representations about safety. 
Okay, thanks. I, I think you've clarified that to some extent. The other point that arose was uh, the, the, the Jura case and the seemingly inordinate time it took in an emergency situation to come to a resolution. Is there an argument that in a situation like that where they have to replace the cable as a matter of urgency, that there could be a fast-track approach of some kind to ensure that the islands, in this case, would have been reconnected far quicker? Well, as I said before, our approach is going to be that if there's a repair to be carried out, you will not have to go through the consents process. It so happens in the Jura case, there was a replacement of the cable and there was representation, strong representations from various agencies and sectors in response to the plans by the power company. So as you can imagine, the, the position that Marine Scotland were put in uh, at that time, uh, notwithstanding all that, if I remember correctly, it was maybe four and a half months or, or, or thereabouts to get through the whole process. So we are actively wanting to make sure that's not as long in the future. I, I recognise that, but there was a good reason why that was the case. Um, so but again, that was a replacement of a cable. If it was an emergency situation for a repair, so there would be a much faster <coughs> process. So, so if I make it, you know, so, so the experience of, of that case, um, from that, would you accept that there, there, there is a need, if it's taking all of these factors into account, to, to, to hasten the process uh, where it can be hastened? Because that is a, a considerable period of time for those islands to have been offline. I mean, Yes. You know, if we can expedite that process, we should do that. And, and uh, you know, we've learnt from that instance. I'm only trying to give the background of why that happened. No, no, and I think absolutely. most people would understand why it happened. Yeah. But in Scotland, we're put in a very awkward position because of the strong representations we're getting from different sectors. And you can imagine if we'd not listened to one sector and there had been some kind of incidents, you know, we'd have clearly, uh, you know, been in a difficult position. So there are good reasons why it took that length of time. But we have to make sure that doesn't happen in the future, if at all possible, as you say. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, I'll go back to aquaculture issues at the moment. Um, there was some concern that in the marine plan, and here's one of the, the specifics, um, that uh, Callum Duncan from the Marine Conservation Society said were concerned that the plan still contains the national target for aquaculture expansion. Now, you talked about the whole plan being uh, there to reflect an overarching approach. But, you know, um, is that appropriate in the National Marine Plan at this stage? And why is that target included? Well, the target reflects our policy in aquaculture, and therefore it made sense to have it within the, the plan. Clearly, I understand that some people and some organisations may not wish to see an expansion of aquaculture, and that's a perfectly legitimate case to be argued. But, of course, it's not government policy. Government policy believes it can sustainably be expanded. But, of course, it has to be sustainable. Therefore, I think there's good reason to have that uh, within the policy. Uh, we need to have food uh, sources for the future. And, of course, the aquaculture sector plays an enormously valuable role in our highlands economy in particular. Uh, and, of course, wider economies in Scotland through the processing aspect of the salmon. So uh, we do want to support the sustainable expansion of aquaculture in Scotland, and therefore it makes sense to have that re reflected as a national policy in the plan. To balance things, of course, we had representations from the other side, which was from the aquaculture industry, saying that we shouldn't be ruling out aquaculture in the east coast and parts of the north coast. So, again, we try to strike that balance. Um, and, you know, you're not going to make each sector totally happy. I accept that. Aquaculture would rather see less constraints and expansion in some parts of the country. We've said, no, we've, we've, we're reflecting existing policy. And those who don't want any aquaculture would rather not see an expansion, perhaps. And we said, no, we're not going there either, because we'd like to see an expansion if it can be sustainably achieved in the future. I think that answers another point I was going to make about the north and east coasts uh, just now, and I understand that. Um, is there a, an intention to ensure that there's a, plans for aquaculture to move further out to sea um, included in your thinking for the guidance? Uh, certainly that is part of our, our thinking, and we have an aquaculture strategy, but we are now giving some thought as to whether or not that should be refreshed in the, the near future, and all these factors will have to look, be looked at. So, um, you know, appropriate assessment is something which is 
cropping up all the time in terms of the way that you, you're working out whether the marine plan is working. Do you think um, um, in the National Marine Plan um, the inclusion of aquaculture expansion targets then you know, is part of an appropriate assessment? Is it something that's likely to be reviewed? I can only really reiterate that the <coughs> it's important that national policies are reflected in the plan and referred to and mentioned. Um, you know, the, the regional plans will have to strike a balance with the national policies. So we're not dictating exactly where, of course, agriculture sites should be. That's a local decision. But we think it's only fair to reflect national policy. Um, and the, the, the appropriate assessments are, are, are of the plan overall. Uh, and, you know, at the time of any particular application for an agriculture site, it will have to go through its own environmental assessments. So that will happen at the time of the actual proposals for individual sites. I can see the consistency in, in having that included because you obviously set out the targets for renewable energy and uh, offshore and that there may well be other national policies where you do include the government's policy with regard to its development. Um, it's consistency that we're looking for in terms of uh, where it's possible to state these policies so that the marine plan actually has between each of its chapters something that read over, reads over in terms of, uh, of that consistency? Yes, well, it's just simply the, the case that we can't project where new sites will be to you know, pro but properly assess specifics. that, but as a policy, we're in favour okay. of sustainable expansion. You've, ex you've explained that well. Sarah Boyack, yes? Just a very brief supplementary on that, just thinking about the uh, potential conflict between trying to expand the industry and then the judgement at the local level. So presumably there will be a policy hierarchy and a decision-making framework thinking about issues like cumulative impact, which you have in onshore planning issues. And I'm wondering if you're thinking about setting out guidelines so that local authorities and the industry can actually look at that in the context of the regional planning framework. My understanding is that is the case. I'll check that point. But clearly, national policies are there to guide local decisions and in every sphere of government, um, as you will know from your own experience, uh, that is what happens. And, you know, we are all signed up as a country that our parliament passes laws and decides policy and promotes policy. And that's reflected throughout the country in local decisions and national decisions. So you can't predict exactly what will happen at local level, clearly, but you set down the policy, which is a driver of local decisions. I think Anna wants to come in here. Could I just add, I think I referred to this in my previous evidence in the December session, specifically in relation to aquaculture. Um, Marine Scotland is currently working on locational guidance that will provide some more of the detail about where the potential for development is most likely to exist. So there will be a more detailed level of locational guidance available at the, the regional level. Is that fine for you, Sarah Boyack? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Alec Ferguson had a point. Uh, you know, I just wanted to tease out a, a little detail on, on the presumption against the expansion of fish farming on the north and eastern coasts. Um, not so much in terms of salmon farming, but I just wonder what the logic is behind that presumption against development on all other species as well, given that, that there is presumably quite a lot of scope for um, expansion of aquaculture into other species. Well, clearly due to the salmon rivers and the fact that the topography and the nature of our inlets, etc., is different in the north and east of the country compared to the west, there has been a precautionary principle adopted in the past not to promote aquaculture uh, in these areas of Scotland. No, I, I can accept so the logic, Kevin, that's what we felt, just to continue that. I can accept the logic thought. for salmon farming, Yeah. but, but a concern was raised with us that it seems illogical to extend that presumption to, to other species, okay. farmed fish? Well, I think our policy, to be fair, has been developed in the understanding that the species that's <laughs> most likely to be proposed for new salmon far uh, for new agriculture in Scotland would be salmon farms. Um, I guess if there was an application 
for a different species, uh, and it depends on the nature of the application, the local authority would have to then decide its own view in terms of national policy. Could I add in? Sorry. Um, one um, sort of technical matter. Um, the language is consistent with the equivalent policy in the national planning framework. And one of the things that we've been trying to do throughout the entire plan making progress is align as far as we could the policies terrestrial and marine, because that's been a strong desire from stakeholders and response to consultation. So to arbitrarily move and do something different in the marine plan from established policy that has already been through the process and has been agreed you know, by this parliament in the national planning framework, um, I think might be a, a bit of a slippery slope. Um, at the moment, there's, as, as the Cabinet Secretary said, there's been no demand um, for other species. Um, and the presumption doesn't apply to closed on land recirculation facilities, which, which might be an, an area of interest, and it doesn't apply to shellfish either. Um, so there are other opportunities there. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, that's fine. Um, move on to climate change issues now, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Uh, could, could we uh, look at, the, obviously, the very important and, and moving information about climate change, uh, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, on the 7th of January, Lucy Greenhill from SAMS expressed concern about the balance between climate change mitigation and um, adaptation in the plan. And she stated, as far as climate change is concerned, we have highlighted what seems to be a poor balance between, and, and just to paraphrase, those, those two. Um, she goes on to say, I think that sometimes the plan is a bit disproportionate, particularly about the oil and gas sector, with regard to which there's a lot of emphasis on climate change adaptations, uh, ensuring your oil rig is not susceptible to rising sea levels, is used as the example. And I go on to quote, but an unequal emphasis um, on how we manage and assess realities of the ultimate effects of oil and gas on climate change. I appreciate this is simply one sector, but if you felt able to comment any further, although we have had some remarks on that um, earlier this morning, but also, Cabinet Secretary, on, on um, the relationship between other sectors and um, the changing picture of um, climate change uh, information on the marine environment. Well, clearly the marine plan and its general policies does address issues of climate change and going towards the low-carbon economy and low-carbon activities, as well as adaptation measures. So that goes right through the plan. Of course, there's chapters on carbon capture and storage, there's chapters on offshore renewables, etc. Some people, of course, can look at the plan and, and look for the answer to their their, their, their key interests and, you know, to answer contradictions and, you know, but again, the plan has to strike a balance and clearly we have an oil and gas industry at the moment. It's an existing activity, plays a valuable role in the Scottish economy and helps meet our energy needs at the moment as we go through the transition in the coming decades from fossil fuels to renewables. So someone looking at the green plan and looking for it to, you know, put oil and gas down the pegging order because of fossil fuel and, and just concentrate on um, clean energy or whatever, it's clearly not going to find that to the degree they would like because, you know, it's reflecting existing policy of the plan. And, you know, so clearly people out there with views on what these policies should be are not necessarily going to find that reflected in the plan because it's, this is national policy. It's not, you know, not going to answer everyone's... Um, um, pet interests because they'll feel particularly strong about one issue. Uh, <clears throat> I can obviously reflect on the language, uh, if, uh, you know, if, if there's particular strong points being made by the, the individual you mentioned, uh, but I can only explain the background of how we got to where we are just now. Uh, and clearly, our seas do have enormous potential to deliver the solution to tackling climate change. I, I understand the point you're making completely, and I'm not advocating any particular... Yeah. Position. I'm simply saying that as the science comes forward, for instance, if we take a different sector like for um, the relationship between the marine environment and fisheries and climate change and how, how um, migratory patterns in fish are moving or whatever, um, just how, how, that will be, um, it, how that will inform the marine plan because we 
you know, we don't necessarily want to be waiting, in my view, five years for those issues to be changed. So I'm not advocating for any particular position. I'm just saying that, obviously, taking into account climate change, which does, as, as you say, come it's actually thread through the plan, but it, it's um, important to be aware of those changes that are going to happen. Yes, and, you know, I think there's a fair point being made in that as science comes forward, that should influence policy. I fully accept that. And if science does come forward in relation to fisheries or other activities in our seas, then the marine plan should be amended in due course to reflect that new science. So I do accept that point. Um, and going on from there, I think probably about the natural heritage and adaptive uh, management. Were you going to yes. continue? Yes. Please do. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, in relation to um, enhancement of the uh, natural heritage um, in the marine environment, um, s stakeholders have expressed concern about the general planning principles, particularly um, uh, Scottish <laughs> Environment Link in um, Gen 9, um, on the natural heritage has, has raised some questions uh, and as particularly as to whether enhancement of the natural environment is sufficiently prominent and um, the, the third um, part of that um, point C cabinet secretary um, just for, for the official record does say to protect and where, pos where appropriate enhance the health of the marine area so I wonder if if you could make comment on whether you see that that, you've used the word balance several times this morning, whether that <laughs> balance is right. Yes. So there may be developments at sea that do not enhance natural heritage, but clearly those new activities would have to be sustainable and have to pass all the hurdles to get consent, but they may not enhance the natural heritage. Clearly, we would not be supportive if it was detrimental to national heritage, but it may not enhance. Therefore, to be prescriptive, I think, would rule out the ability to treat each activity that may come forward on a case-by-case -case basis. And I guess that is our approach to that, and that's why it's not going as far, perhaps, as Environment Link would like, is because you start to rule things out. Uh, and, and, you know, I understand why they may wish every activity that's going to take place in their waters to enhance but clearly there might be some that are not, they might just be neutral, but they're important for various reasons. Right, thank you. And would it be possible to clarify <coughs> in what way uh, guidance would be set out in order to assess um, whether, whether development is enhancing the marine environment or not, so that those decisions can be made um, in an informed way? Well, I guess my answer to that would be that any activity will have to go through its own assessments in any case, and they would hopefully flag up uh, issues which would have to be taken into account by the consenting authorities before granting or rejecting consent. And the, the policies there, uh, as you said, General nine, uh, general Policy Number 9, uh, Natural Heritage, reflects the policy direction. Right, thank you. And, and moving to adaptive management, uh, just to touch on it again briefly, Cabinet Secretary, because it has been discussed this morning already. Um, just to highlight that in the written evidence, Scottish Renewables seeks clarity about um, Gen 20, about adaptive management. And it is concerned, um, and I just quote from, that, that, um, from, from their comment, that ad hoc arrangements to the plan in light of new data would create uncertainty resulting in greater risks for project development and therefore would not be supported and um, last week, Phil Thomas of SSPO stated, getting the tone right and ensuring in terms of adaptive management, um, the platform is not continuously moving is a serious consideration. Um, I think perhaps I, I might say that the, rather than the platform, which would be a bit confusing perhaps um, in terms of, of what I want to ask, it, it's, it's really the framework and how a lot of evidence has shown that ad has expressed concern, rather, if I can correct myself, about adaptive management. And that's not that I'm arguing against adaptive management or for it, but just that as things develop, um, the various sectors will need to understand how they're developing and why. I wonder if you can comment on that. Well, clearly, we are 
saying that adaptive management means you have to take on board new evidence as it becomes available. Um, I'm not 100% sure as to what the concern is that's being expressed. I'd have to reflect upon what you're saying and uh, look at the their representations they've made on that. Uh, but clearly... Yeah, so perhaps sorry. clarify a little bit, and yeah. I hope I haven't got this wrong because I am representing other yeah. people's yeah, views, yeah, yeah. But, but the concern about um, making decisions on the basis of certain guidance and then new information coming forward, um, which is put in the overarching uh, National Marine Plan, um, because it, it is, conclu is evidence ever conclusive scientifically, but, um, but, but in, the, in, for instance, aquaculture, that then the guidelines might have to be changed and that's a complex issue for developers to consider. I hope I'm not misrepresenting. Well, on, on the one hand, of course, we'll have to take into account not wanting to create instability for, you know, activities that are being invested in and are costing money to set up and, you know, you don't want to change the goalposts, so you want stability. But clearly, if new evidence does become available, we have to at least consider it. And, you know, it's difficult to give scenarios or predict exactly what might happen, but it depends on the new evidence that becomes available. Clearly, if new evidence became available that was very serious and perhaps had a detrimental damaging effect to the environment, I think it would be incumbent on the authorities to work with the developer to see what can be done to address that. And I expect you know, any responsible developer would want to work with the authorities to address that. And, and just finally, as a, as a supplementary on, on this section, um, there's obviously... You, you, raised the issue uh, in the overarching framework in your initial remarks about conflict, Cabinet Secretary, and I just wonder the degree to which um, have, have you considered the possibility of there being any mechanism at a, a national level? Would it only be at a regional level for conflict resolution or mediation? Because within a sector and also between sectors, uh, things could be quite challenging, I would suggest. Well, Clearly, we'd be content for Marine Scotland to give advice and intervene to help resolve any conflicts that may arise in the future. The National Plan, of course, also gives some guidance towards how potentially conflict can be resolved, you know, mitigation factors, whatever may have to be adopted. So <coughs> I think it is addressed by the Marine Plan, but of course, Marine Scotland will always stand by to help local authorities or other agencies or sectors resolve conflict. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, another subject is uh, the one about the devolution of the Crown Estate. And uh, people have had a few remarks to make about this uh, because there isn't much mention of the Crown Estate in the Marine Plan. Uh, but clearly its expertise is welcome. Uh, as we heard last week, much of its uh, means of uh, planning offshore is possibly amongst the best that we can lay our hands on. So we have to incorporate that into the marine plan. But are there any implications from the Smith Commission uh, about the devolution of the uh, Crown Estate that you feel any need to comment on or even include in the marine plan as such? Well, it's a good issue to raise, and clearly I, I very much welcome the fact that at long last, after many, many years of, I believe, cross-party support seeking the devolution of the Crown Estate or management of the Crown Estate to Scotland, that we're finally, hopefully at some point soon, going to actually uh, acquire responsibility, and that will be great for our coastal communities, and it will be much more democratic and transparent, and we'll be able to, you know, be held to account in terms of how the Crown Estate is managed in Scotland. In terms of the marine plan, all I would say is that clearly the leases already happen, just that responsibility for the Crown Estate and management of the assets will pass to Scotland. So it's not so much that the activity is not happening just now, it's just the responsibility for it and, and as I said before, other responsibilities of accountability uh, and um, further devolving it down to local authorities and all these other issues that are on the agenda, that will be decided in Scotland. And many of the activities that are addressed in the National Marine Plan arise from you know, the right to use the seabed or, or leases from the Crown Estate. So indirectly, the Crown Estate 
does feature throughout the Hove Marine Plan because it's the leases and the seabed that allows these activities we're discussing today to happen in many cases. Just for clarity, it does uh, marine plan out to the 200 mile and equivalent limit uh, in uh, our jurisdiction. Yes. And therefore discussions about what local authorities might have as their responsibility are, are something that's still to be clarified because the uh, Secretary of State for Scotland was uh, somewhat unclear about that at the Devolution Further Powers Committee when he said that he thought that their you know, remit might run to about 12 miles, but there's some disagreement about that that's still to be sorted out. That's why I just thought it was worth having your one more answer there. Well, uh, the I, 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 clearly I, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, the UK government or, or uh, the Secretary of State, so we do need clarity on these issues from these, uh, these people. But, you know, we want to have all Crown State responsibilities out to 200 miles devolved to the Scottish Parliament, and that's what we expect. And, you know, I think there would be a huge disappointment if we were just to get bits and pieces. If we can have executive devolution of implementing a marine plan out to 200 miles, I think, you know, we should be at least getting the Crown State management responsibilities for all our waters. That's a very good link between the two in, in, in logic. Um, Sarah Boyle. <laughs> Thank you, Convener. And just a, a quick supplementary, and it's maybe more for the future than for now, but I think keeping on, um, keeping on record the need to look at the resource issue in terms of the marine planning done at the regional plan stage by local authorities in terms of their expertise and resource, if there's also additional Crown Estate Commission responsibilities coming to them, it's actually quite a significant lift up in terms of responsibility and a real requirement for new expertise. <coughs> So it's, it's maybe not something that's um, something you pin down in the marine national plan, but it is something that's critical to its implementation. Yes, I mean, point noted, we're very conscious of that. And clearly, once we are absolutely clear as to what's happening, we'll have a lot of work to do with our, our local authorities to make sure that this is all smoothly implemented. <coughs> well, that will be very interesting indeed. <laughs> in a short sentence with a very complex uh, set of processes. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Anna Donald, uh, Linda Rosborough and yourself, Cabinet Secretary, for very lucid evidence which allows us to make a report that I think can be uh, quite incisive and uh, helpful at the same time. Uh, so thank you very much for your evidence today. It's uh, great. Um, we will move into private session, as previously agreed, in a minute or two. The next meeting next week will be uh, Wednesday, the 21st of January, taking place in private, as agreed, with uh, consideration of the National Marine Plan and Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. Uh, I ask the public gallery to be cleared, as the public part of the meeting is closed, and we'll take a short break to allow this. Thank you very much.